Hello, welcome. My name is Chris DeFay. Uh, the authors at Google Speaker Series is honored to welcome author Greg Baer to Google Santa Monica. Greg Baer is the author of more than 30 books of science fiction and fantasy, including Quantico, Blood Music, The Forge of God, and Darwin's Radio. The recipient of two Hugo Awards and five Nebula Awards, Baer's books cover topics as diverse as galactic conflict, artificial universes, networked intelligence, genetic engineering, and nanotechnology. In addition to being a prolific writer, Baer has also served on political and scientific action committees advising Microsoft, the US Army, the CIA, Sandia National Laboratories, and other groups and agencies in the course of this rather remarkable career. Please join me in welcoming Greg Baer as he discusses his latest book, Mariposa. Thanks for coming out here, and thanks to all the people in the far-flung corners of the world here. Um, Mariposa is a follow-on to Quantico, which had an interesting history, which is nearly legendary now. As a science fiction writer, uh, I thought I was continuing to write science fiction, but some of the, my editors suddenly realized I was moving into techno thrillers, and they didn't know how to do that. And so uh, it was kind of caught betwixt and between, and we had a little bit of trouble. But finally it came out, and it turned out it didn't matter. People liked the book, and it was one of my best-selling books. So the publisher came back to me and said, let's do another one. And I think that living well is a dish best served cold, don't you? So <laughs> we're on number two of an impossible series here, which, and I still don't know, you know, is it techno thriller or science fiction? I don't think there's much distinction. Back when I was a kid, uh, reading Analog, uh, John W. Campbell would publish stories that would deal with, you know, new fighter aircraft, super fighter aircraft uh, with a, a, a pilot jacked into the control system working on a hallucinogenic drug to heighten his sense of perception. Top secret, super fast, over North Cape, crashes. How do you get them out? That's a Tom Clancy story, but it was an analog science fiction. So I grew up thinking that techno thrillers were science fiction. I think. Mariposa, I'm, I'm actually moving into another cycle here, which I was a little surprised with. When I, when I finished Quantico, uh, the book is, uh, was published in 2005, written between 2003 and 2004, and it describes a severe economic downturn in the United States. Well, that may or may not be prophecy. It's perfectly obvious to me that was coming. In Mariposa, a couple of years down the road, we are coming out of that, but we have major difficulties. And so in coming so close to the future, that you actually live what you're writing about, I think I need to listen to myself a little more in terms of my stock market pick, which I didn't. Yeah, I'm not supposed to be a prophet. I don't think science fiction typically is prophetic. But it does, uh, in, in this case, I think when we get that close to the present, we need to be really kind of politically sensitive and organically sensitive. I regard politics as biology. And that biology can be predicted if you think of trends, of personalities, of countries that have personalities, of, of psychological profiles. Think of a nation having a psychological profile. So maybe I'm a profiler of our country right now. And in <clears throat> Mariposa, what I'm profiling is a major security problem. And our security problem is that we put ourselves in so much debt, perhaps 20 to $40 trillion over the next 10 years, that we owe our soul to the company store. Now, we've been pretty plush up until recent times. And so our instincts aren't honed for that particular difficulty. And our, our security instincts really aren't honed for that at all. We still think, you know, despite the economic downturn, we still believe that we're in charge of our destiny. But if you look at what's going on right now with the Clintons, uh, with Clinton going to China and Obama going to China, they're not being very hard on China. Why? Because China owns us a substantial portion. So the, uh, the upshot of all of this is that in Mariposa, we've got a major security problem with internal sources. That is, Axel Price is a CEO of a major corporation in Texas, which provides government services and training. And uh, that's been a real issue for me, because I don't believe we should be outsourcing things like prisons, military logistics, and that sort of thing. But along the way, uh, we're also dealing with a situation that I had in Quantico, a description of our security problems being not so much from outside, which is a typical techno thriller area, but from within. I think the dictum that I uh, follow, ascribe to most, is Pogo's dictum, we have met the enemy and he is us. And both Quantico and Mariposa are about our internal problems. And we've really been our own worst enemy since the beginning. If you think of the worst war we ever fought, it was with ourselves. 
<coughs> Excuse me. I've been fighting off a cold here since I've been traveling around the country. The, uh, the whole notion of our history being a kind of a tangle of, of strong passions fighting up against each other is fine as long as we're stable, as long as we don't have severe imbalances. But with this economic situation, what if our internal enemies decide they want to reenact something that's been supposedly gone for 150 years? And that's the situation. Now, in Quantico, my characters, Rebecca Rose, uh, an FBI agent, is now on furlough in Mariposa. She's looking to start a life, to live a life, that she's never really had because as an FBI agent, as a female in a patriarchal, uh, male-oriented community, uh, she's never been able to really do that. Uh, but she's on furlough. She's trying to set up a family. She's trying to adopt a girl. And this is where things get interesting because I'm now going back full circle to novels that I wrote in 1989, realizing the political situations I was talking about in 1989 in a novel called Queen of Angels are happening today. The setup is perfect to just blend Mariposa into the universe of Queen of Angels, which is a universe in which you have computers becoming computers and eventually thinkers, in which you have, in 2047, everyone being therapy. Effective mental therapy gets rid of all of our um, little foibles, our mental foibles. And in Mariposa, the Mariposa treatment is the very beginning of that therapy. And it's a mixed bag because it's brand new. Mariposa takes away all the stops, all the epigenetic learning that you've been through as a biological organism. PTSD, a major problem in today's world, is possibly being treated by Mariposa. Mariposa starts off as a cancer treatment. What is cancer? Cancer is tissue learning bad habits. Cancer is tissue that has been removed or where it's basically had the stops removed from its um, destiny and becomes immortal or wants to be immortal. And those are epigenetic stuff. That's clamp on DNA, uh, on genes. You put a clamp on a gene, and that's the epigenetic information on top of the sequence in the gene. And this is just as important in development, but also in your personality, in your psychology. Because as you go through life, the stress built up on you puts clamps on certain genes. You start to, from birth, organize yourself to fit into the environment that you're in. And if you're in a battle situation or a law enforcement situation or high stress or violence or anything else, after a while, you become locked into a rut of behaviors. And those behaviors are high-stress behaviors. Now, the whole sequence of Mariposa is that in treating cancer, our mad doctor has discovered that you can also stop emotional problems. But in removing the stops of the emotional problems, it turns out you're also taking away the stops of socialization. So there's an element of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde here. You become a tabula rasa. A newborn baby with adult emotions and information. <coughs> the upshot of it all is that Mariposa works sometimes, but in this novel, it's just the beginning. And the opening chapter is a vice president murders his wife. We have an undercover agent working in Texas from the FBI. And then we have a security conference in the Los Angeles Convention Center that goes badly wrong. But in that security conference, you get to look at all of the concerns, the emotions, and the technology of the present day taken, say, umpty ump years down the road, just a few years down the road. The, uh, the whole notion of 24-hour surveillance and 4K video is just down the road. We can have it. We can put the glasses on and, and have our lives completely recorded in 4K video, better than HD. You can have your car set up so that it feeds video to the police if someone's tailgating them. In other words, you have a society with no lubrication allowed whatsoever because everything can be caught on camera. The cops can't misbehave badly. You can't speed on the highway. You can't irritate people on the highway. You can't do any of that because if you do, they'll get you. So the whole idea of freedom becomes less and less, um, let's say, less and less tolerant as we move on down the road. Now, the uh, combination of all of these elements leads to a science fiction scenario. And so I think the techno thrillers and science fiction are pretty much the same. Politically, um, when I wrote Quantico, I thought it was a liberal screed. I thought that I was really coming down hard on the kind of bad rule that we were facing, putting heavy duty stress on our law enforcement people, on our soldiers, on our army, military. Turned out that conservative websites gave it good reviews and thumbs up because they thought it was fair and balanced. I must have been done doing something wrong. 
In Mariposa, it's equally fair and balanced. That is, it's another liberal screed. And the whole message behind it is bad kings kill the land. If you choose bad leadership, if you choose not wisely as to who is going to control you, you face the consequences. And we are in Mariposa facing the consequences still of those years in which we sold our soul to the company store. And we're still facing that, and we will for years to come. If America can be put into receivership financially, what are we going to sell off first? The national parks? The military system? Already we've sold off military training and logistics to private uh, companies. What's the next step? So that's the future I'm looking at. The, the upside is this is a hopeful book. None of my books have been dystopias. They're talking about people having a hell of a hard time but surviving. And at the end of my novel, my characters all survive. They're all doing well, uh, except for one thing. They're completely liberated. We have two main characters, Rebecca Rose and my computer programmer, Nathaniel Trace, who has been working on a computer called Jones. Does anybody recognize who I'm paying homage to here? A worldwide computer system that could control the financial system? It's Colossus, of course, written by D.F. Jones. Um, Nathaniel Trace and Rebecca have one thing in common. They are free of social constraints. Will they be Dr. Jekyll? Will they be Mr. Hyde? We don't know. But for them, the world is completely fresh and new. And so I'd like to go on in the next book to describe that world that they see with completely fresh eyes. Um, I'm not sure where the politics are here, or the technology, or whether you know, the genre boundaries. I don't really see any of these things <clears throat> as dividing or stopping me from moving into one territory. But I do know that in Mariposa, we are now heading into that land of Queen of Angels, and in fact, in this book, you will meet the main character of Queen of Angels, which is set in 2047, a police detective named Mary Choi. In this novel, she's three years old. So we're neatly tying it in, and of course, Queen of Angels leads into moving Mars and heads and, uh, and quantum computing and all the sort of things I was writing about in the 80s and 90s. So I'm having great fun with the whole thing. It's kind of fun to go back and not mash it together the way, say, robots and, and empire were mashed together, but to find that it really does go full circle for me. The politics I was describing, the fears I was working against in the 1980s are still with me. We haven't solved any of that. These are 30-year-old problems that we're facing. So that's where I'm at with this book. Um, I've got a lot of uh, technological details in here, biological and, and programming-wise. And, and, uh, you know, so maybe it is a techno thriller, but I think it's science fiction. Can I answer any questions? Any questions from out there in the vast ether, too? Yeah. Uh, do we need to read the Quantico first before we read this one? Not really. You'll probably enjoy it if you do. But in this one, the plot of Quantico is kind of a reveal. It's a background which eventually kind of creates suspense until you know what actually happened. So I've uh, very cleverly set it up so that you don't need to read that. But you will get more information. So in the books, you seem to present uh, technology and the enabling abilities of technology as sort of a, uh, a risky but ultimately beneficial uh, and you know, ca capable of handling the uh, the issues. I'm I'm curious as to what you really believe are the, the chances of technology at solving some of the uh, you know these other very real problems such as debt and things like that. National debt. As a stand-in for very big problems that we all yeah, have. Large problems. Well, national debt, of course, is, is kind of a psychological, monetary, hormonal problem, isn't it? I mean, money is is permission to get work done. And the way it's manipulated and hyper-manipulated and meta-manipulated around the world is very tough to understand, except from a biological perspective. It's like a brain uh, trying to find blood sugar. And you know, every so often you'll have an epileptic seizure. Uh, and, and the blood sugar is allocated in the incorrect ways, goes to the incorrect areas to solve problems. I think that's what happens when the economy gets kiltered. Is, is, uh, you lose the ability to connect between the, the symbolic value of money and the ability to get work done. So you have things that are hypervalued that really aren't. And suddenly people find themselves with less uh, incentive to do work than they thought they had. And they slow down. They get depressed. 
And how's that not like an organism with blood flow and, and, uh, and all that? So, so solving that problem is, is more of a psychological um, problem than a technological one. And that's really interesting. You could set all the economics in the world to zero if everyone agreed to it and just start over again and say, okay, you know. And they've done this in countries that had hyperinflation. You know, set it all back to zero. Basically, reorient, renaturalize it, renormalize it, like quantum mechanics. If it doesn't work, normalize it. And uh, that's an interesting idea. Other larger problems. Therapy uh, in Queen of Angels was designed to remove the last of our medieval variations. You know, if we take a look at a medieval painting or, or a, a, a Renaissance painting and look at these, all these characters with moles and warts and noses and distortions and hunchbacks and everything, if we watch uh, the Dutch masters painting their, their towns and their cities, we realize that today, physically, we're probably better off than that. But mentally, we still have all those warts and all of those bends and, 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 uh, and problems. Get rid of those, and what do we have? A different society. In Mariposa, we're coming to grips with the early stages of that. What do we want to be? How do we want to define ourselves? How do we want our, 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 uh, our, our personal interactions to go? How efficient do we want to be? How uh, sane do we want to be? I mean, again, this notion that we get socialized by clamping down various genes, acquire an epigenetic veneer as we get older, is probably 100% accurate. That's probably what happens to us. And PTSD, under those conditions, is learning bad habits, which work well on the battlefield or in crime situations or in sense, you know, violent situations, but work very poorly when you're at home in bed trying to sleep. All of these things then come back to what is our, our evolution and meta-evolution and how do we want to direct ourselves. And again, what do we want to do? The question of um, whether it'll work or not is irrelevant because, of course, sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't, just like all the technology we do. Technology is a human endeavor. Not doing it is not an issue. We can't stop ourselves from doing it because we always offer that, that carrot at the end of the stick of, okay, things are going to be better. My question was more to my question was more to what do you actually believe about the uh, you know the likelihood of beneficial outcomes in the future? Oh, yeah. What the, yeah, they happen all the time. I mean, would you go back to 1924? 24 sounds bad. No. <laughs> <laughs> Where would you go back to? Uh, if I could get uh, stuck in. Uh, um, well, no, 24 wasn't that bad, right? It was 29 that was bad, so... It was five years you could have fun, yeah. Exactly. You can sell, sell real estate for five more years, right? Just keep looping. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I guess it was more like, a, it, do you actually see the future as being that bright, given, you know, the... Obviously, technology has gotten us this far, and um, there are issues, but it seems overall to be a benefit. Um, as a futurist, what do you see, you know, in the in the near future? What concerns me most right now is I don't think most people believe there is a future. They don't see any difference or change that will benefit them, and they're afraid nearly all the time. And so they go back to the more cozy stuff, which is the more acceptable stuff of zombies and vampires. These are monsters they know. The future is a monster they don't know. And what do they do? They romanticize zombies and vampires. I mean, pretty soon we're going to have zombie babysitters if we don't have them already. You know, and kids, it's going to be like the Frankenstein's monster. It isn't scary anymore. So we've taken our old monsters and, uh, and, and normalized them, and our new monster is the future. And we don't want to know what it is because we don't know what we want to be. We just don't. America's at a crossroads now. What do we want to do? Do we want to go back to a golden age that never existed? Do we want to move ahead to a liberal view of the world that never worked before? We just don't know. We, we don't know how to handle our finances, how to handle our, our freedom, our equalities. Uh, and yet, somehow, America always stumbles along. We've been in worse situations. So, yeah, I'm optimistic. But think about it. We have been in much worse situations where our passions have produced extraordinary violence. And Mariposa is about avoiding that, about not allowing people to have their worst passions rule the world. But along the way, that means, of course, you got to have you got to kick some butt and bring out some pole axes and all that sort of stuff. And I guess that's what the thriller angle is. Um, so I've got a question. So it seems to me that um, uh, Axel Price's company is very similar to maybe another company that you might have been modeled on. Several different companies. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's an amalgamation, but the one that stood out for me was Blackwater, and and uh, even the name is similar to uh, the owner there. And yeah, and it so. It sounds like a Bond villain, doesn't it? Mm hmm. It does. It does. So. Jonathan Price play Axel Fudge. Like what Texas X. So, so the, the Blackwater comparison was clear to me, um, but since it's an, am an amalgamation, what other companies out there is this, uh, I guess, sort of dystopian corporation that um, you're kind of modeling? Well, I'm, think, you know, I'm thinking of uh, all the service companies that provide services for Washington, D.C., and you know, full disclosure, I've received checks from, from many of them for attending threat conferences and so on. There would be uh, KBR, Kellogg Brown Root, uh, these companies have always been very helpful in Washington, D.C., in setting up uh, conferences, in providing logistics support, in uh, all sorts of support activity. Where I find uh, them to be less than useful is when they're allowed to kill people without consequences. Soldiers aren't. You know, and, and that seems dysfunctional to me. Or when we're going to sell off death row to a private company. That I don't want to see. That, I think, is going much too far. The privatization of security and our armed forces is not a good idea. One, because uh, an army is uh, beholden to the civilians that pay for it. And if you have a firewall between payment, punishment, and performance, and someone can get away with not delivering on their contractual obligations, uh, or violates those contractual obligations, or is never given any obligations under the contract except you know, vague ones, doesn't work for me. America is about Americans controlling their firepower. It's not about uh, removing your sense of guilt or responsibility by assigning it to somebody else that you can say it was their fault. We should be guilty. Does assigning it to someone else sort of open up freedom for Americans, in a sense? How would that be? Well, you have freedom if you don't have to think about those things, right? Well, yeah, you have... Uh, yeah, you have freedom of, of guilt, but if you're guilt-free, you're dysfunctional. You need to be therapied at that point. Mariposa is, is for you. No guilt, uh, you know, no glory. But, yeah, I, I think that that would be one of the reasons people might want to give this up, is they want to live, you know, in their BMW, buy their BMW, have their home theater, and never leave the house because you don't want to pay taxes to build the road. You don't want to build community. You don't want to be responsible for community or for country. Patriotism without responsibility or without a sense of country seems to me to be kind of a, uh, a loose cannon. Do you have a question? I have I was trying to collate. Oh, collating, still collating. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, oh, whichever we want to go first, sure. San Francisco. All right, sort of, you have a great breadth of knowledge and even depth into the research here. I was wondering if you could sort of go into what comes first, your plot or your research? Uh, do you go and read a whole bunch of different things and then file them away as sort of, oh, I could use this at some point in the future? Or do you weave your plot and then sort of go and, and do deep dives into finding out the specifics on the technologies or the, uh, yeah? Yeah, yes, it all counts. Uh, I've been privileged to, uh, to be kind of at the, uh, periphery of a lot of these activities in government, certainly since 9-11, but even before that, by being in consultation with Sandia and uh, NASA and NASA administrators and working on, uh, you know, uh, Citizens Advisory Committee through the 80s and 90s, uh, seeing not only how government works, uh, but also how the personalities interact uh, of, of people who have been in government, listening to old Cold Warriors talk about the Cold War days, utterly chilling. You know, thank God that went away. But it went away with surprising speed because the first meeting I had with the Citizens Advisory Council was in 1983. Star Wars defense was proposed that same year. <clears throat> the Soviet Union started to collapse in 1989. And we could see that there were severe problems, but the reports from the military were that the problems were going to get worse and worse and worse, and eventually computers would be uh, controlling the situation. So that, that basically inspired me to write Enoch. Uh, realizing all of those situations and the personalities and the technologies, I had to figure out what happens if, if something comes in and interferes. The old story in science fiction was aliens would unite us. So what if an alien opportunity comes in and divides us to the point of driving us to war? Uh, like, you know, a, 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 I don't know, a solid gold meteor landing in the middle of a primitive village. What would you do with it? 
So uh, yeah, it's a little of both, all those things together. And, and then uh, later on, coming into uh, Homeland Security, talking at the FBI uh, Academy in Quantico, uh, talking to agents, putting the personalities in place. The stories come later in that case, but some of the research is already there. The impetus certainly is. Thanks. You had a question, sir. So uh, this is frequently asked question, but uh, how would you recommend getting into writing? You know, it's a nano rimo. You have to write. You know, in, in, in your copious spare time, I don't know how many hours you work here, uh, a lot, I suspect. But in your copious spare time, you have to set aside an hour a day or in the morning before you come in. I know my friend Joe Haldeman used to get up very early in the morning and write and then go off and ride and, you know, ride a bike and all that sort of stuff, like exercise. But yeah, one hour a day, put it aside, make sure your family and your, your work doesn't interfere with it, and write. And if you write a page a day, you have a novel at the end of that time. Second clue, don't be afraid. You don't have to show it to anybody. Maybe no one will ever see it. But then you write, it's your own personal thing, you try it out, you have fun with it, you relax, and the zen of relaxing is the most important thing about that. If nobody ever has to see it, you're free. But if at some point you come along and you say, well, this is pretty good, you know, then you can hand it out to, to sympathetic friends and relatives. If, if you don't have people who are supportive, don't hand it out. Just send it straight off to the editor. Because if you're going to be rejected, you might as well be re rejected by strangers. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Any other thoughts about writing? What are you working on? Um, kind of a future history thing. Yeah, yeah. That's where we all get started. <laughs> One of my first ideas as a kid was, you know, let's write this future history, going out through billions of years of history. That's great fun. Ended up in City at the End of Time. Oh, I'm, I'm not going that far more. Oh, yeah. A few decades. <laughs> Now, the, the, yeah, exercising and modeling and playing with ideas this is all great fun. And there's no reason it can't just continue to be fun. But also, if you actually get something good, who knows? Could go further. Other questions? Other questions? Yeah. Um, one of the things you were talking about was how the uh, technology is... Uh, to, to intentionally misparaphrase you, um, you were saying how people are enjoying staying at home and using their uh, widescreen TV and avoiding the inconvenience of going out and noticing that there's a city out there. Um, in, in many ways, uh, this is sort of a culture variant back to when the city out there was the culture because there wasn't much culture you could get at home. So I suspect what's in part happened is the economies of scale have made it feasible to um, create a culture which is physically non-local. Um, but that's driven out of the economy of scale that that's sort of cheaper to deliver to people on average than trying to deliver it in the city. Um, do you see any opportunity for... Uh, it's easy to say technology. I meant more technology in the sense of um, the opportunities for society out of technology, where the technology will remove those economies of scale that's driving the culture away from the cities and essentially make those same communities still there, but they're smaller so that they inherently localize again. We certainly see that in the notion of, you know, small suburban apartment buildings and malls where all your shops are nearby, but I find those areas rather boring. Yeah. And what you want is the unexpected, but what Americans seem to have been trying to go for over the last 20 years is only the expected, thank you. No surprises. I want to pay for a uniformity of excellence, but no surprises. We see it in our retailing, in our uh, entertainment industry. Uh, it, 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 we, we are really trying, as if trying to force ourselves to be more and more uniform. At the same time, we want to be more and more prosperous. When in fact, it seems to me that the most prosperous and successful person out there is the one who's constantly surrounded by good surprises. And you can't generate that by having a controlled environment. And a city, a, a, a well-ruled city, is full of lovely, strange, and sometimes awkward surprises. And that's what makes a biography. My friend Larry Niven says, I've got enough money, I just don't have enough memories. I think it's a beautiful philosophy. And memories are not made by uniformity or expected expectations that are fulfilled. They're made by surprises. But yeah, that's where I'd go. Thank you.
As long, you know, not too much surprise. Surprise heading over into techno thriller shock, I'd like to avoid too. But on the other hand, that's what we like to read about. So. Okay, another question. So I was fascinated by your statement that you you felt uh, that your Quantico novel was kind of a leftist screed in a yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, I can see the sort of what people traditionally sort of think of as left-oriented themes in Mariposa. I haven't read Quantico, but um, what would you say are the right sort of leaning themes that you think your readers have sort of grasped onto? Well, actually, I think it's the, the characters have their own politics. I don't impose my politics on my characters. So most of my law enforcement characters are, in fact, innately conservative. Even Rebecca Rose is very kind of hard-bitten uh, law enforcement psychology. Uh, and I think that, that appeals to people rather than having you know, views imposed upon uh, uh, psychologies that just wouldn't have those views. So I think that's what they're getting. They're getting an honesty of the depiction of the reaction of the characters to the world around them. Uh, as to whether the situation in Mariposa is leftist or not, it certainly criticizes prior administrations. But at this point, the president in Mariposa is a Democrat. And she's still facing incredible difficulties. And, uh, and, and some of them you know, are come from missteps in her own administration. A lot of them come from the past. But that's what all presidents have to face. So what would be like a... Uh a, a left view of government or a right view of government sort of through the eyes of the characters in Mariposa? Mm. Um, I think it'd be more the, the realization that history still rules, the passions of history still rule. Uh, and I don't think conservatives would feel at all comfortable with that notion. Uh, when we have Axel Price at the end of the book, and I won't spoil too much here, uh, spouting off his philosophy of life, it is, I think, you know, a philosophy that many conservatives would find very appealing. And yet, at the same time, you realize he's trying to destroy our nation. Why? Why would he want to do that? What is he reenacting here? Well, he's reenacting a passion of 150 years ago, a resentment that's built up for over a century. And that's, you know, something we usually ascribe to the Middle East. We often say the Middle East is a place where history goes to die. You know, they all hate each other. Well, what's going on here? Same thing. So I think that, that would be considered to be, I think some conservatives would resent that assertion, that part of their philosophy is, is a confederate in origin. On the other hand, the liberals will take no comfort from this book, because I'm, I'm saying that, you know, basically, we all have to work together here. And, uh, you know, not all of, not all of uh, the country that's conservative is going to go along with my Bond villain's attitudes. But who knows what's going to draw us all back together again. But we do need to do that. We do need to come together. And it's possible that this financial situation we're entering will be the, the equivalent of World War II in forcing us to do that. We have a decision to make. Are we going to finance our own country? Or are we going to watch it go down the drain? Be owned by foreigners? Well, it's a big decision. Any other questions from VC? Okay, thank you very much.